My name is Aaron Abke. I grew up in the Bay Area of California as a pastor's son. So church life was my whole life as a child growing up all through high school and into college. We talked about the love of God, the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God. And so at about 23 years old, I had gone to college to follow my dad's footsteps. I was leading worship for about eight years. And when I graduated from Oral Roberts University, I went back to the Bay Area to take my first church job as a full-time worship pastor. And that's when I was first confronted, almost backed into a corner to face the ideologies I had been running from in my religion my whole life. Because the church I worked at was a very fundamentalist church, very different from the one I grew up in. Almost every sermon, there'd be something inserted about everyone else is doomed to hellfire if they don't repent and accept Christ and the rapture is coming soon. And I had experienced a God of love in my heart my whole life because you know worship was really my passion, more of the bhakti yoga. And so I didn't resonate with that view of God. And within just a few months, I was in a kind of internal crisis of wrestling with the fact that I don't believe this stuff. And so accepting that was a really hard step for me because as many of the people listening probably know who grew up religious, when you leave your religion, you're not just leaving a faith tradition, you're leaving an entire paradigm of reality, a worldview. You're leaving your friends, your family, everything you've ever believed in. And so the fear of making that leap into the unknown keeps a lot of people from questioning. But I, I couldn't handle the internal conflict anymore at that point. So I just said, I've got to sell everything I own, move across the country, start a new life, completely re rediscover myself and what I believe about the divine. And so at 23 years old, I quit the job I had just gotten. I did lose almost all of my friends at that point and most of my family outside of my parents and sister pretty much never spoke to me again. But when you're convicted so deeply, I think about who you know God to be and you want to understand the divine on a deeper level, you're willing to make those sacrifices and I think that's what makes it an authentic expression. My biggest passion outside of spirituality was always fitness. And so I found myself in fitness and in CrossFit and bodybuilding and, and things of that nature. Uh, I became a fitness model in San Francisco. Uh, I competed in bodybuilding at the national level. I was very successful in everything I was doing. And I worked at Google at the time with a contracting company named Exos that was a fitness contractor to do personal training at Google. So I was working in the Bay Area at essentially the biggest company in the world, doing what I loved, making good money. And on the outside, had it all. But on the inside, I was crumbling because Christianity, my faith in God, my faith in Jesus was my whole life. And so I, I wasn't able to ever find myself again without that. And no matter what I did, I always was left so unsatisfied and so unfulfilled. And so I would cover it up with more vanity, more muscles, more fitness, more Instagram posts. But on the inside, I was sort of unraveling and becoming more depressed by the day, living a sort of inauthentic life. It wasn't what gave me joy. It wasn't what made me feel fulfilled because I just didn't have a purpose. I didn't have uh, a reason for waking up anymore like I used to as a kid. I used to wake up so in love with God and so excited to experience the day with God. Without that, I just didn't feel any motivation anymore. And so I was seeking enlightenment teachings through Alan Watts and Eckhart Tolle and Muji and other ancient texts. And one of the things I was doing every day at that time was going up to the balcony above the gym that I worked at at Google and spending about an hour on my lunch break just listening to Eckhart Tolle or Alan Watts and just kind of watching the clouds. I had done this for months at this point. And so I can't tell you exactly what it was about that certain day but I was listening to a lecture from Eckhart where he was repeating things to the audience that the ego says to each and every one of us. Things like, if only people liked me more, then I would truly be happy. Or if only I had more fame or success, then that would truly make me happy and fulfilled. And he would laugh after each one he would repeat. And I was laughing because I recognized exactly what he was saying were, the, were all the thoughts that my mind was feeding me every day to keep me depressed and feeling hopeless about life. And so if this guy knows exactly what my mind says to me and this whole audience is laughing because clearly their minds say it to them too, 
then maybe it's all just a big joke. Maybe it's just a voice in the head that doesn't have any, any real reality and we're just giving it meaning because we think it has reality. It was something like that that I connected with. And all I can say is that it threw me into a space of inner silence that was so vast that it, it felt like it swallowed up the whole universe. And for the first time, I was really able to experience the background of stillness behind the moving pictures of life. And I was able to connect with this idea we call oneness. However you, you try to describe oneness, it always ends up sounding dumb, but there was that recognition I'd always heard about. The sky, the trees, the birds, all the other people. It was all just me, like in a big dream or something. And the recognition was so overwhelmingly blissful that I just started laughing, almost hysterically laughing. It seems so obvious to me now. Was I just walking through life with blindfold on? How did I not see this? It's so obvious this is the nature of reality. And so I'm up there laughing hysterically, sobbing, weeping bitterly, and people are looking over at me like, that guy's having an interesting lunch break. <laughs> and so, from that moment on, I spent a two week period in that sort of samadhi state with a very Buddha-like state of consciousness, you might say, where it was impossible to even remember what suffering felt like. All of the years of, of crippling depression were sort of swallowed up in an instant. And the sense of being a separate individual self was also swallowed up because of that recognition that it's all just one happening, one energy, one intelligence knowing itself. And the love I felt for each and every thing I saw was equal to the love I felt for myself, no difference whatsoever. There was just this pure awareness and it was just ecstatic. And so after two weeks of that, essentially what happened was I woke up on the morning of two weeks later and a thought appeared in my mind that said, I wonder if this will be my permanent state of consciousness now but I wasn't aware that that was actually the first thought of ego coming back online. And from that point on, those thoughts slowly creeped back in and that state of, of oneness, we might say, seemed to slip away. And all the suffering thoughts slowly came back on and as they did, there was a panic developing within me, like an existential crisis of, oh my gosh, I'm losing this state. I thought it was a permanent state. Now the old Aaron's coming back, the depression's coming back, and that's not what I want. Like, I don't want to ever leave this state. I was clinging to it, clawing on it, trying to keep it close to me, and it was just being ripped away, almost right out of my hands. And so when it finally settled in, and the full persona of Aaron coming back online, the depression was, it felt three times worse. Because I, I had felt like I was given a free sample of enlightenment, and I wasted it, I squandered it, I lost it. I did something wrong to lose it. I lost the pearl of great price. And so that's where my dark night of the soul sort of began. But because I had that proof, nothing else really mattered to me anymore. I sort of just walked out of my life. I walked out of fitness modeling, bodybuilding, personal training. And I just said, nothing else matters at this point other than returning to that state uh, figuring out how I can integrate that state of consciousness permanently. And if I can learn how to do that, I'm going to devote my life to teaching the world how to do it. The amazing thing about reality is that it can't be escaped. It can't be avoided. And this was another recognition I had during my dark night where the, the suicidal thoughts and the depression was so intense that there was that, that voice in the head of like, just, it's better to just end it, man. Why be here anymore? When your mind is feeding it to you day and night, it's, it can be hard to escape. But I, I couldn't ever bring myself to that because there was something inside of me that intuitively said, that's not how this reality works. There is no escaping it. If you, if you do that, you'll just be back here in another body trying to learn the same lessons again. So it's to your best interest to learn the lessons now, to face your demons and put the pedal to the metal and go for it. In fact, that's why your soul came here. And so most people probably know me as a Law of One teacher and people secondarily know me as an A Course in Miracles teacher. Those are to me the two texts that really were the springboard for my spiritual evolution because I think most of us who leave our religion 
are forced to wrestle with questions like, well, if that version of God isn't real, then maybe there isn't a God like I thought. Maybe, maybe atheism is true. Maybe there's just nothing after this. And that thought terrified me because what that implied to me was I'll never see my family again after this life. You know, when they pass, that's it. All the love we ever shared, all the memories just get swallowed up into some endless abyss, never to be seen or remembered again. And for some reason that, that was just insufferable to think about. And so I began reading near-death experiences, thousands of them, and was looking for proof that there was an afterlife, that there was a God, there was something to believe in. And the near-death experiences proved to me that there clearly was a source, as they called it. Some people call it the light, but they describe it as a source of indescribable, unconditional love, total non-judgment. They can review their whole life and every evil thing they'd done, and that source had no judgment towards them at all. And that was the God I had known and experienced as a Christian kid, so that resonated. And somehow, I don't remember how or why I came upon this line, but in my reading or studying, the opening line from A Course in Miracles came to me, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, and herein lies the peace of God. For some reason, it was everything I was looking for in that one line. Whatever's true, whatever's real, has always been real, whether you believed it or not. And what's untrue is untrue now, even if you do believe in it. So ultimately, there's nothing in this universe to fear. There's only peace. So I started reading it, and the book just, almost like having a guru to devote myself to, it sort of became my guru and helped me to understand why my thoughts, why my mind was troubling me so much. And it sort of walked me out of that deep, deep suffering of the dark night I was in. And then maybe a year after that, I'd heard from someone somewhere about this channel text called the Law of One and finally got around to saying, I'm going to crack this thing open. And it really gives you a metaphysical map of the cosmos you're inside of, the blueprint for reincarnation and the soul's evolutionary journey. And it fills the reader, I think, with so much hope and purpose and enthusiasm for life when you see that you are a soul on an evolutionary journey and you've likely lived thousands of lifetimes in other forms and have many thousands yet to live on this path. It gave me something I hadn't had since I was a Christian kid, which was real purpose to wake up with every day that I want to grow, I want to seek, I want to devote myself to something higher. And so I think one of the most profound teachings from the Law of One for me was this model of the seven densities of consciousness. And the Law of One paints this picture of the universe that we move through these densities of vibration in consciousness on our evolutionary journey. The first density is the density of beingness, the four elements, earth, water, fire, air. And consciousness spends a few billion years experiencing existence in the universe as those four elements. And then after a few billion years, as we know on planet Earth, microbial life begins to evolve and plant life and insect life and animal life and anything that has growth and movement or sentience, you might say, up to the human represents the second density. So after a few more billion years of, of second density life on the planet, eventually we know in science that ancient hominids or ancient humans became self-aware. And so at that point, consciousness does this amazing thing. You can think of it like an about face where it flips in on itself and becomes an object to itself. And that's where the, the knowledge I am is first born. And then uh, the third chakra, the yellow ray solar plexus chakra becomes activated once self-awareness is there. And so this is the birth of the ego and the beginning of the third density of consciousness, which is self-awareness. And so in this third density, we have what the law of one calls the veil of forgetting, where we have no knowledge of previous lives. We don't remember who we are, where we come from. We just sort of appear here and we have to wrestle with and grapple with the nuances of the positive and the negative, good versus evil, right versus wrong, love versus fear. And so the third density of consciousness is basically the density of separation. The Course talks about this idea of um, the belief in separation or the tiny mad idea. I exist as a separate entity in the environment, which means you're separate from me and you're separate from me, which now implies that you might be a threat to me. 
You might be an obstacle for me to overcome or to defend against. And this is where tribes, groups, tribal warfare, and all kinds of atrocities are born through this separation consciousness that we're, we're separate from one another. So we must struggle and fight against one another. And so much like the dark night of the soul, that creates so much conflict in humanity that certain souls will begin to seek for answers to that problem. And that answer is, of course, love. And so the fourth density of consciousness is activated through the heart chakra opening. And when the heart chakra begins to open or the green ray energy center begins to open, that allows consciousness to now have a new perception of reality, which is, okay, it's true that we're all experiencing different bodies, different forms, but it's becoming very clear that we're all one essence, one life. We all have the same consciousness, the same awareness, the same knowing of I, the subject. And so when we begin to treat one another as if you are myself, I'm going to give you the same love I would love myself with, well then that actually makes life work out pretty well. And after enough lifetimes of wrestling with that, the soul will make a choice. I want to choose the path of love, or perhaps I want to choose the path of separation. And so this is the density where the soul has to choose which polarity it wants to be for the rest of its journey. Does it want to be positively polarized or negatively polarized. And the law of one explains both are equally valid from the universe's point of view. It doesn't differentiate. It wants you to make that choice. And the very dark night of the soul that I experienced was actually that third density choosing that every soul has to go through where you say, I don't want to experience this pain any longer, which means I must commit myself to the path of love, the path of forgiveness, the path of peace, and that is where the soul can begin evolving into the fourth density. So the fourth density of consciousness represents the heart chakra. And then the planet becomes a fourth density planet, positive or negative, depending on what the collective consciousness decides. And so I think that that model provides a lot of hope for people who are struggling with depression and hopelessness. And what's my purpose for being here? Why am I alive? And so... I think the first recognition we have to have is that our mind creates a story character over time as we age, as we develop and grow up and are socialized. The mind identifies with whatever the body does, whatever the body feels, whatever the mind thinks. There's a part of the mind which is called the ego that says, that's me. And so I like to simplify my personal definition for the ego as simply that mental activity of identifying the I, me, my, mine. And over time, that act of identifying creates a story character and all of the suffering, all of the depression, the loneliness, the hopelessness, the fear appears to that character, the story of me. And so as long as I invest belief in that story character, then the suffering will appear to be real. It'll be felt as my suffering, my desires aren't met. My fears appear to be real. And so you can't get out of that from within it. It has to be abandoned altogether. You must transcend this belief that you are a body. As long as there's a belief, I am the body, the illuminated state of consciousness can't appear within you because it's being obscured like an object in front of the sunlight. That sunlight's always there. You're always that free, pure, infinite awareness. But the story character is obscuring it. So we begin with, Meditation, contemplation, and self-inquiry, I believe are the fundamental tools for overcoming the story character, uh, the mythical entity that I've invested so much belief in. And as we lose ability to relate to that character, that freedom, that peace just naturally flowers and blossoms from within us. But it's difficult to say to someone who's experienced extreme traumas or abuse or suffering that your past is an illusion or your suffering is an illusion and I think it's important that we get really clear what we mean about that. An illusion does not mean something wasn't experienced. It doesn't mean you didn't have that experience. It means the nature of the experience is not grounded in what's real, meaning it's transient, it's impermanent. We can't find it, we can't weigh it on a scale, we can't find anything objective about it. So all pain, all suffering is either remembered or anticipated. It's either past or future something I once suffered that my mind is reminding me of, or something I'm afraid I might suffer in the future. 
So enlightenment is the state of being pristinely aware of the now moment, so much so that it draws in so much of your interest and attention that you just don't have any interest in thinking about the past or worrying about the future. It doesn't even matter what the future holds because if I can't be grounded in this moment, if I can't find peace in this moment, I won't be able to find it in the future either. So the future can't fulfill me if this now moment can't fulfill me. And also the future can't frighten me if this now moment doesn't frighten me. But many people have this rebuttal to the things I'm saying here, which are, you know, I have too many burdens in life to worry about. I have bills to pay, a family to raise, so many other problems. Uh, I don't have time to seek enlightenment, to meditate all the time, to do the things you're saying. And uh, the good news is that it doesn't have to be like that. If you have the awareness of the universe you're inside of and the way it works, truthfully, everything you need for your own self-realization is being brought to you each and every day in your own life. The inner guru is always within us, bringing us the exact lessons we need. And in fact, we can't escape it. It is always serving us the exact karma that we have created in the past. And so you really don't need to do or change anything about your life to become more self-realized and to begin expanding your consciousness other than becoming aware of all the difficulties, all the problems in your life, and just asking yourself the question, what is this challenge in my life asking me to learn? What is it trying to bring out of me? And so that's why the source creates this universe and puts itself inside of this sort of dream world to live human lifetimes and all the other millions of worlds that exist. It's because it needs an infinite amount of contrast to know and discover itself. And so your own life is that contrast that the source is using to wake up to its true nature. So when you ask a question like, what is this challenge asking me to learn? You begin to find the answers. Ah, it's, it's asking me to learn more patience or perhaps more trust in the divine. I need to just surrender this stress and trust that everything's gonna work out as it's supposed to work out. I need to stop resisting life so much. These things just start to become obvious to you when you actually want to know. And the reason people don't see these lessons appearing in their life each and every day is because most people are just barreling through life, not being mindful, not paying attention, not being present. But everything I do, every action I take, even every thought I have creates a type of karma for me. The law of attraction teaches that whatever I give out to the universe, whatever energy I put out will eventually come back to me. Not instantly, maybe not even tomorrow, maybe a week from now, maybe a year from now, but every energy I put out comes back to me. And so when I believe that and I stand convicted in that, then it implores me to start taking responsibility for every aspect of my life. Meaning if a very challenging or negative circumstance comes to me, uh, if someone is unkind to me, I need to assume that that is a karmic cycle coming back around of something I did to someone in the past or a mistake that I made in the past that I haven't forgiven or reconciled yet. And so this is why A Course in Miracles teaches that the path to heaven is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the bridge from suffering to peace, the only thing that can offload that karma. Forgiveness is the only thing that can shorten the need for karmic experience in this life. And so this is what I learned about also reading near-death experiences, that people have these life reviews and they are able to see everything they did in their life and from the vantage point of the person they did it to. And so they feel the pain, they feel the suffering that they caused, and there's just this aching desire to go back and make it right. Please give me another chance. And so the only reason a soul would not have a reason to return is because they walked the path of forgiveness in their life. They didn't hold anyone else's sins against them. They forgave themselves for the mistakes that they made. And thus the universe says, okay, you are karmically free from that level of consciousness and you're ready to evolve to the next level of consciousness. So I like to also explain enlightenment through the map of consciousness that David R. Hawkins developed on a scale of zero to a thousand, which says that below the level of 200 represents separation consciousness. So we have pride, anger, fear, guilt, shame, apathy, grief, and so forth. 
But once the level of consciousness rises above 200 at the level of courage, courage is what gives us the ability to really look inside of ourselves, to not be afraid to look inside and see what's in me, what needs to be healed, to see my own judgments, to see my own fears, to see my own anger, my traumas, and begin meeting them with healing. And as we rise up the scale and we expand our consciousness, that healing process begins to happen. And when we get to the level of 500, that's the level of love where the heart chakra opens. And so in order for a soul to graduate from this density level to a fourth density lifetime in your next incarnation, you must reach that 500 level of consciousness in this lifetime or the heart chakra must be permanently opened. And so we all experience moments where the heart chakra is opened, a moment of love or connection with somebody. You experience that 500 level of love, but then typically we'll go back and revert to the same level of consciousness we were at before, maybe around two or 300, and the heart chakra will close. And that happens because the heart doesn't have the ability to filter energy through it of separation or fear or judgments it doesn't resonate to that frequency, so it has to close. So we can open it for, for the time being through those moments and experiences of love, but it will close again as soon as judgments and fears are in the system. And so really, we are here to learn the lessons of love. Now, this is what the Law of One and A Course in Miracles teach, that this is how we remember who we are. This is how we tune into that field of oneness that's always here, that knowledge that we are not separate. But it has to be seen through the eyes of the heart. The mind will never see it because the mind is wired to only see separation. So in that sense, we have to allow the heart to teach the mind what oneness is. And so when I had that two week experience of total oneness, I was only seeing life through the heart. And when that two week period ended, my consciousness reverted back to whatever level it was at. And then the heart chakra closed again and I was back into separation consciousness, but I had experienced I had firsthand evidence that that state of consciousness is absolutely real and available to the human in this life. And one of the other teachings that A Course in Miracles and the Law of One both speak about is this idea of the world or the universe we experience being an illusion or a dream. And this is a difficult one for people to get behind because, I mean, it sure feels real, right? It feels physical and dense and like it's really firmly happening. But again, the word illusion doesn't mean something isn't being experienced. It means that it's something that depends on something else in order to exist. It's something that isn't permanent or doesn't have any source to exist in and of itself. So an example of that would be the moonlight. When I look up at the sky at night, it appears like the moon is shining a light from itself, that it is its own source of light. But we know that that's actually an illusion because it's only reflecting the light of the sun and the moon doesn't have its own light. Likewise, a wave could be something that's said to be an illusion because you can't have a wave without an ocean. The wave is just something that the ocean is doing. So this is the nature of reality that there is a substratum, a background, a field, a matrix, you might say, of awareness or consciousness and everything is appearing and disappearing in that infinite field of consciousness. It's appearing as matter, but we know through quantum mechanics, when we zoom into what we call matter, we don't actually find anything that we can consider matter. We just find these vibrating particles of light, you know, photons vibrating at different densities and quantumly entangled with one another, such so that when we zoom out from a very vast distance away, it looks like a chair or a human body, but it's just light. And so this energy is always dancing and appearing as different forms, but it in and of itself doesn't exist. It depends on the field of consciousness, no field, no matter, but there is a field without matter. We call that the void. And this is what we experience in deep states of meditation. When you relax so deeply into your, your own self that you lose the sense of being a body, you forget that you're a body, you lose the sense of time. Nevertheless, there is an amazingly vibrant experience of aliveness happening, of sentience, of awareness, and you can actually experience deep planes of inner bliss and peace in that state 
where there's no objective qualities there. There's nothing you can say anything about there. And my favorite movie is The Matrix, primarily because it is, in my estimation, just the perfect depiction of this whole conversation, that this reality we live in is not the ultimate reality. There's something behind this, deeper than this, more transcendent, and we can access it from within this matrix. And so there's so many great analogies in the movie that speak to the nature of the mind. And the first one is the character of the agents in the matrix. The agents serve to make sure no one's waking up. That is a perfect example of how the ego works. That the ego is like a mind program that is there to make sure awareness doesn't expand very much. Because as awareness expands, the mind loses its grip on the consciousness. It can't control the consciousness anymore to do what it wants or think what it wants or have the behaviors that it wants. And so when we start awakening, we find that these agents called ego start coming after us and trying to pull us back into body consciousness, into separation consciousness. And so Neo goes through this journey of evolution, discovering himself to be so choicely named the one. He is the one that was destined to realize the true potential of an awakened being in the matrix, which is that once you awaken to this matrix, you are no longer subject to its rule set. And so we have the famous scene at the end of the movie where Neo is shot and killed and then has this resurrection, a lot of Christian parallels there to the Christ figure. And he, he rises up and now has this new awareness that it's all just a computer simulation. It doesn't exist. And so he sees the famous green lines appearing in front of him and making up these agent figures and realizes they're not even really there. So if I don't have any belief in them, they have no power over me. And so famously, he starts dodging the bullets effortlessly and, and fighting off the agents effortlessly. And this is the state of uh, the 600 level of consciousness, of non-duality, where consciousness realizes this very thing, that it's all just an illusion in the mind and once you realize it's an illusion, the agents will still be there for a while. The ego will still be there fighting to get its territory back, so to speak. But once you have that conviction of I am beyond everything, I am the consciousness, the eternal element, those agents, that ego is effortlessly defended. It doesn't have any interest for you anymore. You don't even need to exert any effort to overcome it. You're, you can allow it to just be there. And none of the thoughts, none of the stories have any meaning anymore because you've seen the unreality of the character to whom they're speaking. That it's just a bunch of ideas, it's a scrapbook of stories and memories that you've just been referring to as I. And once the I, the sense of I, is no longer being endowed upon this story character, you very much become like Neo in the Matrix. You wake up to this awareness that I am the one and the mind has no power over me. And so I think the, the movie is so archetypal in that way that it really speaks to the human journey of spiritual transformation. And when I left Christianity, I felt like it was the first time in my life that I truly understood Christ on a deeper level. I was always so fascinated by Christ and, and reading the red letters, wanting to know more about this man's relationship with God but Christianity doesn't give you much of a context for Christ's own state of consciousness. This was an enlightened being, a true ascended master who had that state of God realization. And this was expressed through many of his famous sayings like, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That I that Christ referred to was not the body, was not the person or the persona, because Christ on the same hand would ask people, if you wanna be my disciple, Die to yourself. Get rid of the idea of yourself. That's the prerequisite to following me. So if Christ was imploring his disciples to get rid of their sense of self, clearly he wouldn't have been speaking from a separate sense of self. He was speaking as the universal I. And so when Jesus said things like, I and my Father are one, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, those passages always made me come alive. But I assumed as I was taught that that was something exclusive to Christ. Only Christ was one with God. And the best we can do is just sort of confess Christ as our savior and let him be our relationship to God, essentially. But when I left the church, I understood that Christ was just expressing his own self-knowledge in a way that was true for everyone listening if they could see it in themselves. 
And so Christ, I see, was inviting people into this relationship of knowing your oneness. And that if, if it's true, like we say, like we teach, like we worship, this one God, this one source of all life, all existence, then that has to imply that only God exists. And the implication of only God exists means you are that, I am that. But it's not a person claiming to be that. It's not an ego claiming I am God. Like I, the person, am making the stars align and orbit around the galaxy. I'm not doing any of that as a person. Everything I see, everything we experience in this universe is equally that one source, that one I. And so again, this is a recognition that you can't grasp with the mind because the mind is transfixed in duality. It only knows separation. It only knows objects and separate things. But we experience this reality through the heart, through the awareness of oneness, by seeking it, contemplating it, falling in love with this idea that all is the one pervading self and I am that. And the heart teaches the mind the true nature of reality. It comes first through the heart and filters its way up to the mind in what we call understanding. And this was something that I was deeply missing on my journey for a long time, was that I pursued only knowledge. Uh, I studied, I, I read, I watched every lecture I could find on non-duality, but it wasn't, it wasn't rescuing me from my suffering. Until one day, at the sort of the bottom depths of that dark night of my soul, I, I was in a place of, of crying out to God and just saying, look, I don't know what you want me to do anymore. <laughs> I meditate every day for hours a day. I read every text I can get my hands on. I, I practice forgiveness. And yet I'm feeling empty inside more and more every day. How do I escape this hell I'm in? What do you want me to do? And it was literally like a ray of light coming out of the clouds and illuminated my mind. And a voice inside of me sort of spoke and said, Aaron, did you forget that you used to love me? <laughs> you used to worship me, you used to have an intimate relationship with me. And since you left Christianity, you forgot that. You forgot that God is love, not only knowledge. And I had turned God into this intellectual pursuit. I was trying to understand oneness and non-duality through my mind, which ultimately is a losing endeavor because the mind can't get it by itself. It needs the heart to help it out, to teach it. And the knowledge of God in the heart is what we call love. You have to begin serving people. You be have to begin having compassion. And you have to begin pursuing God in a devotional relationship. I'm going to do what's right because that's what you are. You are truth. You are righteousness. So I'm going to live from integrity. I'm going to do everything in a way that honors you and honors life around me and reflects this belief in oneness. If everything's one with me, then I can't put anyone out of my heart anymore. I can't hold anyone in contempt or unforgiveness, I have to begin forgiving people. And so when I recommitted myself to that path of love and devotion, it was like being on a roller coaster or a super accelerator for my awareness that all that knowledge I had gained finally started landing somewhere and integrating. And this, this abiding recognition that all is one, all is myself, just sort of opened within me in a very effortless way. And so I began teaching on YouTube on the law of attraction. And it became very clear that the law of attraction and the law of oneness were the same thing. And that these enlightenment teachings I became so fascinated by were just maybe a higher level of understanding of what we call the law of attraction. Everyone is just at a different stage of consciousness, you know, somewhere on that spectrum. And because of that, people need different teachings to take them from where they're at to the next level of understanding. And so, as we know, many people who are just getting into spirituality first do so through law of attraction teachings, watching The Secret or listening to Abraham Hicks. And what attracts people initially is you can create your reality, you can manifest your desires, you can have anything you want. If you can believe it, see it, and imagine it, it can be yours. And I think as we put law of attraction into practice, it teaches us this law of karma or this law of oneness, that because I am everything, I have to experience everything I put out at some point so if I put out negative energy into the universe, I'm going to attract that back to myself at a certain point because all is one. There's nowhere for the energy to go other than back to me. 
because I am the one energy. So if I put out negative energy in the form of hatred or abuse towards someone, I will manifest an experience in my future that gives me the same feeling of negativity that I gave to someone else. Because ultimately that person is me in a different body, in a different dream character maybe, but it is myself. And this is what I think Christ was pointing to when he said, when you did not visit the prisoner, when you did not take in the widow and the orphan, when you did not feed the hungry, you didn't do it to me. So don't call me Lord if you're not gonna feed the hungry and take in the widows and the orphans because they're me. And his disciples didn't understand what he was, what he was saying because they were still in that separation consciousness. But I think the, lo the law of attraction will teach us that I am everything because it's impossible for me to give something that I don't receive at some point. So it behooves me to put out good energy, to put out positive energy into the universe because I will get that back. And I think that that's a very important stage of a soul's growth to learning about oneness is that we have to experience oneness in the form of what we call manifestation, which is really just another word for karma. What you put out is what you get back. And all that law of attraction teachings do is they say, hey, you want good things in your future? Put out good energy now. Think about it now, experience it now, and you will attract a future outcome that matches that frequency. Because you are that energy. So if, if I am looking into a mirror, right, I am the reflection I see. But if the mirror is frowning at me, I can't get mad at the reflection for frowning. Right? I'm the source. I'm the one frowning into the mirror. So all I need to do to change my experience is to smile into the mirror. And I think this is how the soul learns about oneness. And so one of the main teachings of the law of attraction is this idea that if you want something, you have to actually let it go or not be attached to it. And that's typically the hardest part of manifesting something that you really desire. Because what we say in law of attraction is if you want something, experience it within yourself, feel it, imagine it, visualize it, and then let it go and trust that it's going to come to you. Don't keep desiring it and, and thinking about it and clinging to it because then you're sending out the signal to the universe that I believe I'm lacking this, which is that reflection in the mirror, right? If I'm clinging to something, I'm frowning into the mirror. But paradoxically, what that does is it teaches us to overcome our desires one by one. And as we, as we slowly let go of our desires and as we experience them through manifestation, it begins to teach us that none of these things actually satisfy me. None of them actually lead me to the happiness and the fulfillment I'm looking for. And so we will continue to manifest fame, fortune, wealth, success, you name it, until a certain point is reached where awareness realizes and accepts the fact that nothing in the world can actually fulfill me. And that's the important point of the journey where we, we start to turn inwards and say, maybe what I'm looking for has always been deep inside of my own being. Maybe that peace that I want, that fulfillment is somewhere inside of me. And that's where law of attraction turns into the enlightenment teachings. But it was really always the same teaching, just being seen at different levels of consciousness. And another really helpful teaching that the law of one puts forward is the understanding that every soul is at a very unique point in their spiritual path. This is why A Course in Miracles teaches not to judge your brother, as, it's, as it puts it, not to judge the other person for where they're at, because just like we can't judge a second grader for not being able to do algebra, it makes no sense to judge someone for being wrapped up in fear and anxiety. That's just where they are. That's the level of consciousness that their frequency is vibrating at. So until they expand their consciousness, they don't have access to anything higher than that. And so this understanding really is a gateway to love and compassion, I think. You will lose the ability to hold any of their transgressions against them because you see that they're just where they are and it doesn't make any sense to hold where they are against them because certainly I remember when I was at a stage like that and I can relate to the fact that I didn't have access to a higher knowledge at that point. Words ultimately don't teach us, life teaches us. So until life brings someone the experiences, or as the law of one says, the catalysts that they need to grow and evolve, um, that's just where they're at for the moment. 
And so this, this compels us to love and forgive people and to let them be where they are, to not have this need to be a savior, to save everyone, to try and convince them to see things the way you see them or to put spiritual practices into their life that they're not ready for. All it does is compel me to embody the truth of love and oneness, to live from a place that I become a conduit for God's love so that I don't need to, to speak or preach to anyone. They can, just by virtue of being around me, absorb that energy of love and that will begin awakening their consciousness. I believe it was St. Francis of Assisi who said, preach at all times, but use words when necessary. And one of the most frequent questions that I've been asked in the last few years since teaching these things is how do I overcome this fear of getting rid of the person, of dissolving the separate self, the story character? There is a gap we come to that does require a leap of faith to trust that on the other side of somebody is something good, something worth going for. And even though this is what all the, uh, the avatars, the ascended masters speak of, like the Buddhas, Christ, Krishna, we still have a problem trusting it because we haven't experienced it yet. So to me, this is where the nature of the self becomes more and more clear in that there is the experience of I being the knower, and then there's the experience of a world outside of this I. And they appear to be two different things. But when we really investigate it, we find that this I can't know itself without a world, something to reflect what it is and interact with. And so if the I cannot know itself without a world, can we really say that they're two separate things? So really what I is, is two parts, the unmanifest and the manifest. The unmanifest is the experience of I, the awareness, the knower. And this element is unchanging. It never changes, it never gets stained by experience, it never gets touched by anything. It's always the same pristine feeling of I, I exist, I am aware, I am conscious. And then we have the manifest, which is the world. And that is always changing, full of qualities, colors, shapes, and sounds, always transient and impermanent. And so the manifest reflects the unmanifest. And through that, we see that these two are actually one, which the Hindu tradition just calls the self or Brahman. It's the eternal element that was never born and can never die. And ultimately, that's what we are. But that self is so vast and infinite that it takes millions of lifetimes for a soul to evolve into that understanding and fully crystallize it. And as we experience more of these states of oneness and love and uh, connection to everything, we start to learn that this is what it means to say, I am nothing. But to say I am nothing doesn't mean that there's no more experience. It just means that there's no more sense that I'm separate from the experience. And that actually invites so much more beauty into our life, so much more of the mystery and the awe and the reverence for life. When you experience that oneness with everything, it's like everything is silently rejoicing in that oneness, in that unity. And it's inviting you into it. You're giving up an illusion for everlasting life. You're giving up something that was never true in the beginning for something that's always been true. And you prove this to yourself through your own experience of meditating upon it and desiring it. And your sense of being a separate character kind of disappears into that vastness, that happiness, that oneness. And as that happens, it's not that even the fear disappears, but the one who was afraid begins to disappear. And if you're at this stage, there really is no going back in the same way that you can't rewatch a movie that you just watched. You already know everything that's going to happen. You already know, you know, the rising action, the climax, the twist, you know, everything already. And so it can't grip you in the same way. And that's the way that the story character becomes. Once you see it's unreality, it just becomes like a movie you've already watched and there's just nothing there for you any longer. And so as we get rid of the story character, an amazing thing happens, which is that life just begins taking care of itself because there's less and less this feeling of a separate individual doer of actions that has to do everything by itself. 
this heavy burden of existing every day with all this pressure, I've got to turn the gears of life, it just begins to disappear as the character disappears. And you find that things just happen effortlessly. You work the job without the stress anymore. You pay the bills without the stress anymore. You find yourself cooking, cleaning, doing laundry, and you're so connected to that divine essence that it's like an eternal wellspring or something. The divine is equally present in all of those activities. And more and more as you become aware of that, that background of, of oneness, you're tuning into that more so than the activity in the form. The form, the activity becomes a means of tuning in rather than the reason itself. And so again, when the character disappears, life takes over and there's no more experience of I am living my life, but the experience just becomes I am being lived. But you can't really look back and say, when was the moment that I became free of that character? When was the moment I fell asleep to that character? It happens timelessly in a sense, sort of like slowly and then all at once. And once that story character disappears, it leaves nothing in its wake. No footprints, no remnants. There's nothing in you that can relate to it. It's just like a dream you once had. In the same way you wake up each morning and the dream you had last night, no matter how good or bad it was, it just doesn't have any meaning anymore because now you're awake to reality.